The DNA ligase enzyme uses ATP to seal breaks in the sugar phosphate backbone. The DNA ligase enzyme uses an active site lysine residue to mediate the reaction. Before it can actually seal the break, the ATP molecule used in the reaction is first attached as an adenylate to the lysine residue. The amine nitrogen of the lysine residue mediates nucleophilic attack at the phosphorus atom of the alpha position of ATP. This creates an oxyanion intermediate, and when those electrons fall back down to reform the double bond, the diphosphate can act as the leaving group. Further hydrolysis of the diphosphate will release a lot of energy, and this will help drive this reaction in the forward direction. So this is the second time now that we're seeing the formation of an adenylate complex. So here is the double-stranded DNA. It's going off in this direction and off in this direction. And we can see that this is the place in the backbone where the DNA is now not connected. And so we can see there's a free 3' hydroxyl and the 5' phosphate that need to be linked back together. We also have the active site of the ligase enzyme that has been activated with the ATP to form the lysine adenylate. So as the DNA ligase is scanning the DNA, when it finds this break in the backbone, the active site is aligned so that the free phosphate group in the DNA molecule is in proximity with the AMP lysine residue. An oxygen from the free phosphate group will mediate nucleophilic attack at the phosphorus of the AMP lysine residue. This will again create our oxyanion intermediate. As those electrons fall back in, the lysine will serve as the leaving group. At this point, the AMP has now been transferred to the downstream phosphate in the DNA backbone. So you can see the incorporation of the AMP onto the 5' phosphate group of the DNA where the DNA break has occurred. The lysine residue of the DNA ligase is now free. So once this phosphate group has been activated with the AMP, it's reactive enough that this hydroxyl from the 3' position can now mediate nucleophilic attack at this residue, and yes, again forming our oxyanion intermediate, and now the AMP can serve as the leaving group. This restores both the enzyme and it's going to reseal the break in the DNA so that now your 3' hydroxyl is linked with the 5' phosphate group of the downstream strand. So essentially, our break in the DNA is now sealed. So this is the crystal structure of the DNA ligase bound to the DNA molecule. You can see that it forms a clamp around the DNA. This enables the enzyme to attach to the DNA and then slide along it where it can check and scan for nicks in the backbone of the DNA. So that takes care of most of the major elements that are occurring during DNA replication. However, we need to consider one more aspect of the process. As the helicase at the front of the process unwinds the double-stranded DNA so that the replication bubble can move in the direction of synthesis, this creates added strain upstream of the replication fork. This strain is caused by increasing the supercoiling of the DNA ahead of the fork in a positive direction to relieve the supercoiling in the area of the helicase when you're unwinding the strand. So if you had no way to release the strain that's created upstream, DNA replication would come to a halt. Thus, the topoisomerase enzyme system is required to help alleviate the strain or the superwinding that goes ahead of the replication fork. So the topoisomerase enzymes come in two flavors, type 1 and type 2. Let's talk about type 1 first. Type 1 topoisomerases relieve tension that's caused during the winding and unwinding of DNA. One way that they can do this is that they can make a, a cut or a nick in one strand of the DNA, as shown here. The 5' phosphoryl side makes a covalent link with the enzyme, 
and so it's never released from the enzyme. The three prime side where this break has occurred is tethered to the enzyme by electrostatic interactions that help mediate the unwinding of this strand around the DNA. So you've made a break and now you're going to unwind the DNA to help release the tension. And then you can re-ligate the strands back together and you have one less turn now in the DNA. So type 1 topoisomerases help to mediate the relaxation of DNA. And this process does not require any energy because the unwinding is going to release energy in the process of breaking the DNA. So if you wanted to introduce new supercoils and make this structure go back in this direction, you would need to add energy to do that. So that does not take place by the type 1 topoisomerases. The type 1 topoisomerases tend to relax the DNA. The E. coli topo 1 enzyme can only remove negative DNA supercoils, but not positive ones. Thus, the enzyme is not involved in relieving the positive supercoiling that's caused by the DNA helicase during replication. This is in contrast to the eukaryotic topo 1 enzyme that can relieve both positive and negative supercoiling. Although the E. coli topoisomerase 1 is not directly involved in relieving the tension caused during DNA replication, it is essential for E. coli viability. It's thought to help maintain the balance of the actions of the type 2 topoisomerases and help maintain optimal supercoiling density within the chromosomal DNA. Note that the enzyme naming is independent of which family they belong to. These are two separate things. So the E. coli topo 1 enzyme happens to fall in the type 1 class, but so does the E. coli topo 3 enzyme. Topo 3 is also a type 1 topoisomerase. So the naming is a little bit unfortunate and can be confusing. So just be sure to always include what you mean. Are you naming the enzyme or are you naming the class that it belongs to? Type 2 topoisomerases have multiple functions within the cell. They can increase or decrease winding tension within the DNA, or they can unknot or decatenate DNA that has become tangled with another strand. It does so by a more dangerous method than their type 1 counterparts. It does so by breaking both strands of the DNA during the reaction mechanism. So within this mechanism, one strand of DNA will bind with the topoisomerase 2 enzyme. The topoisomerase 2 enzyme will use the energy of ATP to actually cleave apart that strand. It will also bind to a second molecule of DNA. And when it mediates the break in this strand, it's going to pass that second molecule of DNA through the break. So if you have two completely different strands of DNA, you could pass this strand through that strand and then reseal this strand. You could also do that with the same DNA. So if these were connected down the way, you could pass the entire strand through and then reseal the break. For molecules that are extremely long and can get in a knot like that, it can be really a lot faster to just break the DNA and pass it through to fix that knotting that can occur during the DNA winding. So DNA topoisomerases are going to perform a very important function within the cell. And this function requires the activity of the ATP molecule. It's going to cleave the ATP to release enough energy to mediate the cut in this fragment and then it will release ADP at the end of the reaction. So this one requires energy. The DNA gyrase enzyme is the topoisomerase 2 enzyme that is primarily involved in relieving positive supercoiling tension that results due to the helicase unwinding at the replication fork. Type 2 topoisomerases, especially topo 4, also addresses a key mechanistic challenge that faces the bacterial replosome during the termination of DNA replication. The circular nature of the bacterial chromosome dictates that a pair of replosomes 
that initiate from a single origin of replication will eventually converge on each other in a head-to-head -head orientation. Positive supercoiling is going to accumulate between the two replosomes as they converge. But the activity of the DNA gyrase, which normally removes the positive supercoils, becomes limited by the decreasing amount of the template DNA ahead. Instead, the supercoils may diffuse behind the replosomes, forming precatanes between the newly replicated DNA. In E. coli, these must be resolved by topoisomerase 4 for chromosome segregation to occur. This is just showing some of the tangles that can occur when you have circularized DNA that's being replicated. Just to give you another visual for that. So you can see here when you get two DNA strands, and these are the circular DNAs that you would see in bacteria, they can form catenanes, and these are just uh, essentially linked circles of the DNA. So you'd have to break apart the DNA and then pull that circle out from this circle to get the two DNA strands to be able to be separated into the daughter cells after replication. So the last area we want to talk about is the termination of replication. So like we were just saying with the topoisomerase enzymes, the origin is going to open up and you're going to have replication occurring in a bi-directional fashion. So you're going to have one fork going in this direction and you're going to have one fork going in this direction. Ultimately, those two forks are going to run in and meet each other at the other side when the replication finishes. To cause the termination, there are specific sequences that the replosome is going to run through that will help slow down the replication process so that you can release both of these replosomes at this location on the chromosome and they won't go through and try to re-replicate anything that's already been replicated. So for this process, the TUS proteins are actually involved with the termination of the DNA replication in, in the prokaryotic species. And these are really important for genomic stability within these organisms. So you have 10 TER sites. These are 23 base pair sites within the region of uh, each side of the replication fork. And these are the sequences that are going to be bound by the TUS protein. And so the uh, TUS protein is a monomeric termination protein. And that's shown in this diagram over here. So the DNA molecule is this kind of lavender molecule that's shown in the ball and stick formation here. And then the TUS protein is shown in the ribbon diagram in the uh, berry color and the yellow color for the beta pleated sheet structures. So the TUS protein binds to these TUR sequences with very high specificity. And they bind in a one to one ratio so when they bind, they form a permissive side, and then they, then they form a non-permissive side too. And so this non-permissive side is called the lock complex. And so what happens is it, the protein actually twists a cytosine residue, and so that cytosine residue is shown in yellow here. It twists it out of the alpha helix, so it normally would be across from its guanine base. And it's twisted here, and now it's interacting with the TUS protein. And so this makes a non-permissive side. And so this is kind of like those spikes uh, in some of the parking lots where they don't want you to back up. Right? You can go over them in one direction, but if you back up, you can't go o over them in the opposite direction without puncturing the tires in your car. The TUS system is that same way. So if you're coming from the permissive side, you can pass over this and keep going. And so uh, the replication machinery, if it's coming in this direction, it's going to be able to pass through and keep going. But if the replication machinery is coming in the other direction, that's the non-permissive way. And when it runs into this, it'll get bumped off of the DNA and that replication fork will fall apart. So what you see is when you have replication going on in this bi-directional format, the replication machinery going in this direction can pass through these 
ter domains because they're going in the correct or the permissive way. But when they come over off of this side here, if they get this far, they're going to hit this ter domain in the non-permissive orientation. So they'd run into that cytosine residue that's sticking up there. And that would displace the replication fork at that point, and it would fall off of this molecule. The same thing is going to happen on this side as well. So you can have uh, the replication machinery all moving down here. And these are oriented so that the permissive way is in this forward direction or the arrows are pointing. And then if it gets past here, these tur domains are in the opposite orientation. And when this replication fork hits over here, it's going to run into the non-permissive orientation and it's going to fall off the DNA as well. So you can see that both replication forks get down here and they're going to bump into each other or they're going to bump into the ter domains actually and they will fall off of the DNA at that point. So regardless of whether this side happens faster than this side, it doesn't really matter. So if this one gets stalled up here for some reason, maybe it inserted an air or something and had to do some repair and it taking longer to get down here, um, it doesn't matter. This replisome will only go this far and then it's going to fall off of the, the machinery at this point. Right? So both of them have to complete their replication for complete replication to occur on this molecule. This diff region in here is the place of decatenation. And so the topo 4 enzyme is going to be really important uh, for activity in this region of the chromosome to release that tension. And so that's a specific place where topo 4 is going to be working on the DNA. All right, so in the next section, we're going to talk about the replication of some extra chromosomal elements within the prokaryotic systems. So how plasmids get replicated.